that it seems like some days, you know, everything goes wrong. <laughs> everything goes wrong. And, uh, and it's, it's important, especially on those days, that you really keep your head in the game. And that's what we're talking about this morning is the mind. You know, we've been talking about, about the heart. Proverbs 4.23 you ought to all know what that says by now. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring. <laughs> Summer, fall. <laughs> no, out of it springs the issues of life. Out of it springs the issues of life. Uh, we've learned that there's a lot of things involved, though, in keeping the heart. There's a lot of things that are involved in, in keeping the heart. We talked about carnality, how... How uh, the carnal mind is at enmity with God. Okay. Uh, we talked about the things that choke the word of God. You know, that we hear the word and in the weeds grow up. You know, we remember the story about the parable there about how the, the word gets choked. We talked about sliding backwards. Sliding backwards. How you can even fall away. Today we're going to talk about thinking with a new mind. Thinking with a new mind. You know, I, I had a doctor tell me uh, a number of years ago, you are what you eat, drink, and think. You are what you eat, drink, and think. And uh, the more I've thought about that over the years, the more I believe that's right. Uh, we are to think with Christian minds. So what is a Christian's mind to think about? How is a Christian's mind supposed to operate? How does it work? How does it work that God is happy with it? How does, what is a Christian mind? It is a mind ordered by the Word of God and the will of God so that the dictates of heaven penetrates the mind and then the mind instructs the feet and the hands. You know, I'm, I'm learning, I've learned and we've all learned this, that, that everything in us is tied together. You know, the heart operates with the mind and the hands and the feet all operate together. It all works together. The result is a walk on earth that reflects the new mind which was received from heaven, from God. And you might have heard the old adage that says that, that someone is so heavenly minded he's of no earthly good. The point of being heavenly minded is so that you are of earthly good. If you're heavenly minded, you're going to be of a lot of good here on earth. You know, witnessing for God, being a, being a light for Him in, in this world that we live in. The world needs to see uh, godliness lived out. If they want to see godliness lived out. You know, it's, it's, it's really em encouraging when you hear of, of uh, some of these athletes and you hear people say, you know, this guy was a real Christian. This guy, there was nothing phony about him. Gary Carter just passed away this, this past week. And uh, he was a catcher for uh, Montreal Expos back in 1980s, 85, 86, and, and New York Mets and different ones like that. And, uh, and it's, it's pretty impressive when you get some of these teammates come on. They said, you know, this guy was genuine in his faith. He was very genuine in his faith. And that's what... God is wanting to see in our lives. He's wanting to see godliness lived out. He's not just wanting to hear us speak about it. He wants to hear us live it out in, in our lives. Uh, the world needs to see more godliness lived out, so it's critical to set your minds on the things above, according to Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Okay, so, if, so what we're talking about this morning is your mind and your walk, which is tied together. Your mind and your walk. If you're going to think like Christ, it must become a way of life every day. He can't be sacred on Sunday and, and secular on Monday. He can't be sacred on Sunday and secular on Monday through Friday or Saturday, whatever it is. Ephesians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles, verse 17, talks about the new man. Talks about new, the new man. When you become a Christian, you become a new man in Christ, and that means that you focus on godly things. You focus on Jesus. You focus on things that are spiritual. Um, and we start with verse 17. It says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should, should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, 
being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. <coughs> Who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. So you notice there he's talking about the mind and he's talking about the heart because there is a, a, a connection there, a very, very strong connection there, your heart with your mind. Okay, notice how Paul links the mind to the walk, which is key. And in the Bible, walk means it's used for the course of living or your lifestyle. When you walk, your course is set. When you walk to get to a destination, you, you don't go in giant steps. You know, I'd love to go into uh, cardiac therapy on Monday morning and be able to take two long steps and be done with the treadmill. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. You've got about a thousand steps over ten minutes, and then they put you on a bike, and you got more of those and all that kind of stuff. It'd be, be nice to walk well, two long steps and you're done, but that's not the way it works. It's a lot of different steps. It's a lot of steps to get to the final destination. You don't take a giant step, but you walk step by step. The Christian life is not an airplane ride. It is a walk. You don't jet to spiritual maturity. You don't jet to spiritual maturity. But it is a daily walk. You go one step at a time. And he's talking here about the Gentiles walk. He says, Then I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Now, whatever way they're walking, you better not walk that way. Whatever way they're walking, you better not walk that way. Because he says there uh, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Don't walk that way. Walk a different way. The Gentiles, whichever way these people are walking, we need to head the other direction. Because they are walking in the futility of their minds. Now these Gentiles were non-Jewish people living in, in, in uh, Paul's day, who had not come to Christ, who had not accepted Christ. The Roman uh, Empire was a sight to behold. It was a glorious empire. The Ephesians were Gentiles, so they would have been tempted to walk exactly like the other Gentiles. The Gentiles, when he's talking about the Gentiles' walk, they were walking uptown. They were walking in strength. They were walking in knowledge. They were walking in education and degrees. They were walking in, in, in all the things that the world would term to be successes. There was still slavery, and there was still poverty, but it was at the bottom of the society. But it was still a, a, a place to be. The Ephesians, Ephesus was a key city in this world. But Paul says here, he says, don't walk like these people. Materialism and pleasures were their thing. That was the key in their life. That was the thing that drove them in their lives. And he says, hold it, you've got to think differently than these Gentiles think. He says to walk like who you are. Walk like who you are. Be genuine about who you are. He says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, you know, up at the start of the chapter, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called. You know, and that's the thing with Christians. We've got to realize, we're, realize our calling. Who called us? What we're called to. We have the highest calling of anybody in the world. You know, God has called us out of this world of darkness into His marvelous light, and we need to walk like that. Worthy of our calling. How do we walk? How do we walk as, as Christians? Walk according to who you are. You're called and make sure you walk a great walk. There's a story that is told about Queen Elizabeth when she was a little girl. She used to sit in a very slouched position. And she used to sort of just hang out and lay back. But one day her mother said to her, sit up. You're going to be queen. You're going to be the queen. Her, her mother related the, her posture to the person. 
She was saying, when, when people see you sit, they need to know that you're a part of the royal family. And it's like when people see you walk, they need to know that you are a part of the family of God. <coughs> when they see you walk, they ought to see you walk differently from what the world walks. They ought to see you walking differently from the way the world walks. They need to see you walking as a part of the family of God. Are we walking like that or are we walking like Gentiles? Are we walking like the rest of the world? Are we walking in a way that it would be hard for, for them to pick us out as being Christians? These Gentiles had a mind problem. They walked in the futility of their minds. Now notice a couple things here uh, with this. It's not that unbelievers don't walk, but when they walk, they have nowhere to go. You ever do that? <laughs> you just walk and walk, and you, you know you have nowhere to go. It's kind of like golfing. You know, <laughs> when I'm out there walking, it's like, what am I doing this for? <laughs> Why am I here? <laughs> you know, it, it, I went the other day golfing, and it's out there. It's like 15 deer around, and that was the best part of the golf, the whole, the, the, by far. <laughs> The best part. But they, they walk. It's like they didn't have nowhere to go. They have nowhere to go. Futility means emptiness. Vanity without purpose. You know, it's okay to want to be a doctor or to be a scientist or whatever when we're older, but how are we going to use that for God? How are we going to use that for God? Okay, we may say, okay, well, I want to have this career. I want to do this, so... So when I'm older, I can have this retirement, live this kind of way, blah, blah. Okay, what happens then? What happens then? Okay, then you reach, you know, you have a family and kids grow up and see them go. Okay, what happens then? You know, then you come to retirement. Okay, what happens then? You know, and sometimes it's like we just kind of exist. And, and we're walking, but walking nowhere. Walking nowhere. Unbelievers are moving, but not going anywhere. Their activities may produce money, power, and prestige but produces really nothing. The problem is their mind. It's not informed by the life giver. I recently came across an interesting uh, bit of information about television. Television, the most popular mindless entity available to us today. The major networks target their prime time programs at 12 year olds, at 12 year olds. They figure if they can get the kids they'll get the adults too. Because when people sit down in front of a TV, they shut down their minds. Think about that, we do that, don't we? You come, in, you come in after working all day and stuff and you sit down and how many sit down in front of a TV to be mentally challenged? I don't mean mentally challenged, but I mean mentally. <laughs> challenged mentally. <laughs> Sometimes you feel mentally challenged. <laughs> you sit there, you want to be challenged mentally. You don't, we don't do that. We sit down because we don't want to, from a TV, we don't want to use our minds unless you're watching Jeopardy or something. You know? We sit down there with empty minds, and so what they do is they fill our minds. Okay, if you're going to sit down with empty minds, we might as well fill it for you, and they fill it for us. That's why our Visa cards are, are maxed out, because we see a commercial on there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't sit there thinking, okay, I'm going to be disciplined. When this commercial comes on, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. But we don't do that. We come with empty minds. We sit down in front of a TV, and, and they, 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 they shut down their minds. How many times have you sat down to a TV and shut off your mind? They catch you with empty minds. So we need to rid ourselves of Gentile minds, of a Gentile mind, of an unbelieving mind. It also talks about darkening minds. In chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it says, Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Oh, there we have the heart again. Okay, so it's obvious here the mind and the heart are connected. Unbelievers have blinders on. The blinders <clears throat> come from Satan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and in verse 4, it says, Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them whose mind the God of this age has blinded. 
That's why it takes the Holy Spirit to bring someone to Christ. It's like Satan gives out spiritual sunglasses that block the light. You know, I've come to a conclusion, one reason people wear sunglasses is to look good. Blocking the light is secondary sometimes. Because some people wear them indoors. I always used to wonder about that. Why, why do they wear sunglasses indoors? Just shut the light off. <laughs> if the light is that bright, just shut the light off. But they don't do it for that. They do it for fashion reasons. They wear that, you know, they wear them indoors. Not, not, to be, not, not to see clearly, but to be seen, to be in style. And that's how Satan works. Satan works in stylizing sin. He works in stylizing sin to try to make you think, oh, that sin's not that bad. Everybody else is doing it. It's okay. You know, if you don't do this, it's, you're not going to be cool. You're not going to be in with the crowd. You know? And he tries to stylize. He gives you the sunglasses to reflect off the light of the gospel. We need to take those off. Stylized, stylized and sin. Adultery is now called an affair. Abortion is now a choice. Homosexuality, homosexuality is now an alternative lifestyle. And so on. Sin gets, gets so stylized that it becomes acceptable. The unbeliever's mind gets so messed up that he is walking around in the dark thinking he is in the light. And so once again... He gets a hard heart. He gets a hard heart to the things of the gospel. We've talked about that in the last few weeks. A hard heart to the gospel. The word means, the word hard means that it's calloused all over. That's why you try to win kids to Christ before they're, they're, they're very old because a lot of times the older they get, the more sin gets them and callouses their heart. So you try to win them when they're young, when they're sensitive to the gospel. What is hard-heartedness? Do you have hard-headed kids? <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> do, have you had, do you have hard-headed kids? Uh, it is the refusal to do what you know is right. To be hard-hearted means that you refuse to do what you know is right. Bill Cosby says, I, I think kids have brain damage because when you tell them to do something, they don't do it. Then when you ask them why they didn't do it, they say, I don't know. That sounds like insanity to me, he says. But that's how people become spiritual. We read the Bible. We know what God says. We know what the Word of God says. We, we say we believe in God. We believe it's true. We believe in Jesus. We believe, you know, but why don't we do what it says? Well, I don't know. I don't know. We know we ought to read our Bibles. Why don't we? Why don't we? <clears throat> we know we ought to be in church. Why don't we? I don't know. I know I need to pray more. Why don't I? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's like hard-heartedness, isn't it? Hard, hard, hard-headedness. Hard-heartedness. Okay. But that's how we become spiritually. We need to be learning Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 20. It says, But you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the seeful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new mind which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Learn Christ. We need to learn Christ, I guess. He's talking about the Gentiles. They walk independent of God. But you Ephesians, he said, have learned a different way. You Ephesians, he says, you Christian Ephesians, you know better. You know better. There's a putting off and a putting on. A putting off and a putting on. When Jesus comes along and he, he cuts the rope of the old man and says, let go of him, you're free. That's what happens at salvation. Let go of him, that old man, and you're free from Philippians chapter 2. You know, if we're to learn Christ, what is that? What is it to learn Christ? Ephesians chapter 2. You know, this is the first sermon I ever preached. Verses 5 through 11. 
that this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. In other words, take this mind that was in Jesus and put it in you. Okay? Take this mind that was in Jesus, what he thought, what he acted like, how he behaved, how he responded. Take that mind and put it in you. That's what he's saying to do here. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay, that's where he was at. He was equal with God. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. The mind of Christ. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. But the thing that I, I think stands out there is the fact that he was, it, 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 was, it, was no, uh, it wasn't robbery for him to be equal with God. That's what he was at. So when I watch TV and I see a football player run 100 yards or 50 yards or whatever it is and score a touchdown and dance around like he really did something, I thought, you know, Jesus could have walked right down through that 100 yards and nobody would have touched him. <laughs> you know. When I see a basketball player, he, he does a slam dunk and then he goes to the crowd like, oh, look what I did and all this kind of stuff. You know, Jesus could have slam dunked it without leaving the floor like that or made a 100-foot shot or whatever it was. Without leaving the floor. You know, and you talk, see, the guy is smart with a 4.0 average, like, oh boy, look what I've done, and all this kind of stuff. You know, Jesus would have known the answers to the questions before the teacher knew the questions to the test. You know, that's how he was, but he took on the form of a servant. He didn't do anything else, he took on the form of a servant. You know, so at a time when we think, you know, look what God has done. Look at what I'm, I'm doing. Look at what I'm capable of achieving. Look at all these accomplishments I've done. Look at, look at where I'm going in life. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Stop. No, because Jesus, when he came, he could have said, look at me. I'm the son of God. I am equal with God. But no, he didn't. He took on the form of a servant. He took on the form of a servant. He became obedient unto death, the cruelest death, the worst death. And he did that because of us, for us, for our sins. Take on the mind of Christ. <clears throat> Didn't consider to be robbery to be equal with God. Made himself of no reputation, but took on the form of a servant and became obedient to the cross. So to learn Jesus, you have to empty yourself. You have to empty yourself. You have to empty yourself totally of yourself. And then you have to plug in. <clears throat> you have to plug into Christ. His mind. Let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. And when you do that, you connect the mind with your heart. You connect the mind and the heart with your hands and with your feet and with your mouth. And everything that you say and do, and go and whatever. That's what he's talking about. When we've talked this last series, when we've talked about in this series about the heart, He's not calling for just a little part of your heart, a little part of your day, a little part of your week. He's calling for totally you. You have to empty yourself of yourself. And you have to plug into Christ, the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ. And it's easy to say that. It's easy to do that when you're sitting in here and there's 70 other Christians sitting around you. But when you're out there during the week, when you're the the dog at the refrigerator waiting for a sandwich and it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. But, you know. <laughs> when you're out there at work and being ridiculed because of your, your, your faith, or you're out there at work and you're being tested about your faith, you know, that's, that's when he's saying, okay, let your light so shine before men that they may see your works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. That's when he's saying, Put on the mind of Christ. Put on the mind of Christ. Let's bow from the Lord. Almighty God and Father, as we have studied about the heart and the mind and Father, the relationship there, Father, we pray that we'll just surrender our hearts 
in our minds solely to you. Father, sometimes we've done that, but then we've allowed things of this world. We've allowed Satan to darken our minds and darken our hearts. Father, help us, Lord, that we'll be sensitive to your guidance and be aware of the wiles of Satan. Father, and be aware that, that he is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Father, we know that we are on the menu, Father, that, that we are there, that he's looking to devour us. But Father, help us that we will be strong. Father, that we will depend upon your help and your guidance. Father, we know that, that our righteousness is as filthy rags, but Father, that through Christ that we can, we can have that salvation through him. Father, forgive us for the times we fall short and the times we, uh, we err. And Father, just help us to always look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. It's in his precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.